Hey everybody, just before the video starts, I just want to let you know that there's a couple days left of our contest where you can win a free care package of Time Spiraled Remastered cards. All you need to do is go onto our Instagram page, link in the description below. You just need to click on that picture and type 333 for your chance to win. Our draw ends on April the 12th and April the 13th we will be drawing the winner. Until then, good luck and enjoy the video. Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new episode of War Talk and welcome to the brand new General Warfare Headquarters. It looks a little white, I get that, trust me I do. I literally just moved in on Friday, last Friday I should say. So bear with me here, there's not a lot of decor up and literally everything is around the floor. <laughs> Nonetheless, that aside, we're here to review all the Strixhaven Commander cards. So, Strixhaven is gonna be released upon us on the 23rd, so that's two weeks from today. So if you haven't started pre-ordering your stuff, boxes, singles, go ahead and do that right now. So Strixhaven is all about wizards, no duh. But this is all about the magical college from magic's history. So this is an entire plane about wizards and learning and all that. Not only that, we also have dragons included in this set which I'm always a huge fan of seeing dragons in sets. I love dragons, it's probably why I'm so attached to Scion of the Ur Dragon as you saw in my personal decks. You've, I've always been attached to like dragon themed decks and all that, and just dragon themed anything. I'm not to the level of Seto Kaiba, don't get me wrong, that's a little too extreme for me. Nonetheless, I'm deterring from the point. Strixhaven, Strixhaven is a new plane for magic, for learning, for wizard degree, for new cards, and ultimately, for us commander players, it's a new set to see and to snatch all the good commanders and to see what's good and what's viable and what, honestly, what's our new commander? What's the new, what's the new thing everyone's talking about and what's our, uh, something that we want to build ourselves? So with that being said, let's get started with our very first commander, which is Mavinda, student advocate. So Mavinda is a 2-3 for two and a white, legendary bird advisor with flying and zero. You may cast target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard this turn. If that spell doesn't target a creature you control, it costs eight more to cast this way. If that spell would be put into your graveyard, exile it instead, activate, only once each turn. Now, this is just a quick commander to get out. It can flashback targeted spells out for free. Mono White is not the best when it comes to ditching cards, but what White lacks in ditching cards, it makes up with really good targeted cards and removal, like Swords of Plowshare, like Path to Exile. Even Condemn is a really good one for this, and it'll be absolutely free with Mavinda. Next we have Blex, Vexing Pest, and his reverse, which is Search for Blex. So Blex is a 3-2 for two and a green, legendary pest. Other pests, bats, insects, snakes, and spiders you control get plus one, plus one. Whenever Blex, Vexing Pest dies, you gain four life. And search for Blex is two black black for a sorcery. Look at the top five cards of your library. You may put any number of them into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. You lose three life for each card you put into your hand this way. For search of Blex, this is Moonlight Bargain. Effectively, you get to look at the top five cards of your deck and you get to put any number of them into your hand and you pay a bit of life to get so. But honestly, that's actually not a bad, that's not really bad at all. The only downside to this is Search for Blex is a sorcery where Moonlight Bargain is maybe one more, but for instant speed, and it's so good. And for Blex himself, he's not really that amazing. He's not an amazing commander. The Anthem effect on creatures is okay at best. If you're gonna stick him into some spider or serpent tribal deck, go right ahead for him, but he's better off in the 99 rather than being a standalone commander himself. Next is Extus, Auric Overlord, and the reverse, Awaken the Blood Avatar. So Extus is a 2-4 for one, white, black, black, so effectively Orzov, for a legendary human warlock with double strike and magecraft. The magecraft is whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, Return target non-legendary creature from your graveyard to your hand. 
and Awaken the Blood Avatar is 6 black and red for a sorcery. As an additional cost to cast a spell, you may sacrifice any number of creatures. This spell costs 2 less to cast for each creature sacrificed this way. Each opponent sacrifices a creature. Create a 3-6 black and red avatar creature token with haste and whenever this creature attacks, it deals 3 damage to each opponent. So Magecraft is not always amazing, this card shows its strengths and it gets to return creatures to your hand when you cast instants or sorcery. That's pseudo recursion right there. You get to repeatedly get your creatures back whenever you copy spells. However, in Orzhov itself, that's not always going to be the case where you can always copy a spell. However, Awaken the Blood Avatar gives the access to red where red can copy those spells. So this is effectively a Mardu commander for red, black, and white. And Mardu has some amazing spells to cast and copy themselves. The reverse, basically Awaken the Blood Avatar, is just opponent sacrifices creatures and you get cool dorks in the uh, interim. So for me personally, I would just play this as Exodus with a bunch of copy cards so that way you can keep returning your creatures. Next we have Jadzi, Oracle of Arcavios that transforms into Journey to the Oracle. So Jadzi is a 5-5 for 6 blue blue legendary human wizard where you can discard a card and return Jadzi Oracle of Arcavios to its owner's hand and has Magecraft. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, reveal the top card of your library. If it's a non-land card, you may cast it by paying one rather than paying its mana cost. If it's a land card, put it into the battlefield. And Journey to the Oracle is 2 green green. You may put any number of land cards from your hand onto the battlefield. Then if you control 8 or more lands, you may discard a card. If you do, return Journey to the Oracle to its owner's hand. So Jadzi can effectively protect itself with that discard a card ability. Get to return it to its owner's hand. And effectively, you get to nullify any card that tries to target it. That being said, the spell reduction from the Magecraft ability is really something amazing. Especially with blue, this is another color that gets to copy a lot of instants or sorceries. So whenever you're doing that, you either get a land onto the battlefield or you're paying one for whatever spell that is. The journey is basically fast bond with a major upside over fast bond's drawback, where with this, you get to discard a card if you have eight or more lands, which in Commander you're more than likely going to have. And you get to return the journey back to its owner's hand. So you're, you're constantly dropping lands and this is a just repeatable ramp. Next we have Kian, Dean of Substance. And the reverse is Imbraham, Dean of Theory. Now Kian is two and a green for a 2-2 two -two legendary elf druid. With the tap, exile the top card of your library. If it's a land card, put it into your hand, otherwise put a study counter on it. And four and a green to create a 0-0 zero zero green and blue fractal creature token. And put a plus one plus one counter on it for each different mana value, which is the newer version of say converted mana cost. Among non-land cards you own in exile with study counters on them. And Imbraham is a 3-3 for 2 blue-blue, legendary bird wizard with flying X blue-blue and tapping to exile the top X cards of your library and put a study counter on each of them. Then you may put a card you own in exile with a study counter on it into your hand. Now, Kian, I'm not super sure of. Seems a very odd and not exactly the most practical. Considering a lot of the times in green and blue, you want, always want spells effectively. And just ha having to constantly exile them, especially when you're in dire need of, car of cards, is not great. Effectively, if you're, pay if you're playing in budget, it's not great. But if you're playing in a much more pricier and competitive meta, you can kind of manipulate it with scroll rack or other cards of that value or nature. And the Fractal Creature, it's okay. Five mana is a lot. And even then, like, you don't always have time on your side in Commander, so Kian can get destroyed even before then. Even before um, you have the opportunity to put that Fractal Creature onto the battlefield. However, Imbraham is probably the better version, but by a slight margin, only because 
it gives you the card advantage over other players. You can selectively get a card from his ability to your hand when you need it. With all the study counters and all the cards in exile, you just use Imbraham and you get to effectively choose, pick and choose what card you need in your hand at the time. And Imbraham's ability is at instant speed. You don't have to do this on, just on your turn, so it makes it much more valuable to do. Next, we have Mila, Crafty Companion, and the reverse, Luca, Wayward Bonder. So Mila is a 2-3 for one white-white legendary fox. Whenever an opponent attacks one or more planeswalkers you control, put a loyalty counter on each planeswalker you control. And whenever a permanent you control becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, you may draw a card. And Luca is a 5 loyalty planeswalker for 4 red red. The first, the plus one ability is you may discard a card. If you do, draw a card. If a creature card was discarded this way, you draw two cards instead. Minus two, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. It gains haste, exile it at the beginning of your next upkeep. And the ultimate minus seven, you get an emblem with whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, it deals damage equal to its power to any target. Mila herself is a fun little super friends card. Basically, whenever an opponent tries to attack you or one of your planeswalkers, mostly one of your planeswalkers, you get to put an extra loyalty counter on them, getting them closer to that ultimate ability. But as a standalone commander, there she's not gonna really turn heads in your direction. Like, you're not gonna really see that many commanders, uh, sorry, I should say, planeswalkers in red and white. It's not gonna be an effective super friends deck, ultimately. Now, Luca, he's nothing special. I mean, red, all he, he's basically red incarnate on himself. You get to rummage as your first ability. You get to return a creature and give it haste and exile it, which is almost like sneak attack, but from the graveyard. And the uh, ultimate ability is just Warstorm Surge on a Planeswalker. He's not amazing, and I don't personally see this deck or any deck like this going super, super far or super, super wide when it comes to board presence. Next, we have Plarg, Dean of Chaos, and the reverse, Augusta, Dean of Order. Plarg is a 2 2, 1 and a red legendary orc shaman with tap, discard a card, draw a card, and 4 and a red and Tap, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a non-legendary, non-land card with mana value 3 or less. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Put all revealed cards not cast this way on the bottom of your library in a random order. And Augusta is a 1-3 for 2 and a white, legendary human cleric. Other tapped creatures you control get plus 1, plus 0. Other untapped creatures you control get plus 0, plus 1. And whenever you attack, untap each creature you control, then tap any number of creatures you control. With Plarg, Rummage is always a key ability in red and especially in colors that can't directly draw. White has a lot of problems drawing and red, the best way to draw is through Rummage. So this is probably one of the better cards to do so. Effectively, he's, he's not gonna be anywhere near what Anya Falkenroth can do, but he's pretty good himself. The second ability is pretty strong and it's, and it's very not broken, letting you cast stuff with uh, mana value three or less and basically bottoming the rest of the cards. Now, Augusta, I'm not gonna lie with you guys, Augusta's really bad. I would just play Plarg and just splash white with him. Honestly, you don't need anything more. You don't need to do anything with Augusta unless you wanna do a challenge deck, but even then, I would strongly recommend against it. Next, we have Shaylee, Dean of Radiance and Ambrose, Dean of Shadow. Shaylee is a 1-1 one, one for 1 and a white legendary bird cleric with flying and vigilance and tap, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each creature that entered the battlefield under your control this turn. And Ambrose is a 4-4 four, four for 2 black black legendary human warlock with tap, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on another target creature. Then Ambrose, Dean of Shadow, deals 2 damage to that creature. Whenever a creature you control with a plus one plus one counter on it dies, draw a card. So, Shaylee is not a strong white card in general unless you put Shaylee in a blink deck herself. I mean, honestly, like you're not gonna really be blinking Shaylee too much 
but you use the plus one plus one counter ability on each creature come in came into play this turn put basically boosting their stats but ultimately she's not great i would personally say Ambrose is the powerhouse out of this couple putting a plus one plus one counter on another creature and dealing two damage to that creature is very very good in comparison to what Shaylee can offer. I would honestly build this as an aristocrat style deck and even still you can just put Embros in an aristocrat style deck and it's gonna pop off immediately from there. You get to draw a card from whatever creature dies with a plus one plus one counter on it. A lot of tokens easily die to Embros's ability and even still as long as they have plus one plus one counters on them you can literally just sack them and draw a number of cards. Next we have Uvilda, Dean of Perfection, and Nasari, Dean of Expression. Uvilda is a 2-2 for 2 and a blue, legendary Jin Wizard. With tap, you may exile an instant or sorcery card from your hand and put three home counters on it. It gains at the beginning of your upkeep. If this card is exiled, remove a home counter from it. And when the last home counter is removed from this card, if it's exiled, you may cast it. It costs four less to cast this way. And Nasari is a 4-4 four, four for 3 red red legendary Ifrit Shaman that has at the beginning of your upkeep exile the top card of each opponent's library until end of turn you may cast spells from among those exiled cards and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. Whenever you cast a spell from exile put a plus one plus one counter on Nasari. Uvilda's ability itself is like pseudo suspend. It's perfect in a Joy of the Gitu deck. Basically, you get to cat, you get to suspend instance of sorcery cards, and you get to cast them for much, much less. Even though suspend itself, it comes into the battlefield immediately, and I believe suspend is just permanence. However, Nasari is stolen strategy on a body that pumps himself. It's very fun, very interactive, and. I can really see Nasari fronting this pair and going ballistic, honestly. This is such a fun little commander, I would, I, I would personally build around it. This is not a spoiler in any way, shape, or form for the next Brewing with 50 Bucks episode. I'm just saying out loud here. Next we have Valentine, Dean of the Bane, and Lisette, Dean of the Root. So Valentine, Dean of the Vein, is a 1-1 for one black, legendary vampire warlock with menace and lifelink. If a non-token creature an opponent controls would die, exile it instead. When you do, you may pay two. If you do, create a 1-1 one, one black and green pest creature token with when this creature dies, you gain one life. And Lisette, Dean of the Root, is a 4-4 four, four for two green green legendary human druid. Whenever you gain life, you may pay one. If you do, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control, and those creatures gain trample until end of turn. So with Valentine, I'm not a big fan of the ability. The keywords are really good on him. Menace is very strong. Lifelink is a very good ability as well. The two together are very, very strong. Basically, if you have Valentine on turn one, you basically swing and you get an extra life on top of the 40 life you already have, or 30, depending if you're playing 1v1. But the ability itself, I'm not a very big fan of. Me personally, I can't really explain why. It's just, I guess in the in the event of somebody going off and a creature dying, you can exile it. It's still limited compare in comparison to what other cards in black can do. And basically, Lissette is also pretty eh. These are, there are cards that do much better than Lissette does individually. There's much better cards in both black and green that get the job done better than either Lissette or Valentine does. Next we have Belladros Witherbloom. Belladros is a 4-4 four, four for 5 green black, which is Golgari, legendary elder dragon. With flying, at the beginning of each upkeep, create a 1-1 one, one black and green pest creature token with when this creature dies, you gain one life and you get to pay 10 life to untap all lands you control. You can only activate this ability once each turn. This is in contention to one of my favorite commanders to come out of this set. This is easily in the top three, which all three of them you will be revealing itself throughout this video. Both abilities are very functional. At the beginning of each upkeep ability where you create tokens harkens back to Coma from Kaldheim where you get to create coils, just not as big. You get one one black and green little pooplings that whenever they die you gain a life but that second ability the pay 10 life to untap all lands you control is 
so, so nice. You pay life to untap your lands. That is probably one of the best abilities I've seen on a creature in some time, honestly. And obviously you can put, lend this to token strategies where you basically get to make a lot of little pests, you sack them to gain life, and then you use the extra life to untap all the lands you control and play more stuff out. Like I said, having that untap ability, not only is it really good, but it's dangerous in longer games when you have at least 10, 15 mana available to you in just land form. And next we have Dina, Soul Steeper. Dina is a 1-3 for black and a green. Again, Golgari for a legendary Dryad Druid. Whenever you gain life, each opponent loses one life and you can pay one and sacrifice another creature. Dina gets plus X plus zero until end of turn where X is the sacrifice creature's power. Now, Dina is very much growing on me. It's obviously an infinite combo enabler with Sanguine Bond. That little combo itself has never run dry in Commander. Sanguine Bond and Exquisite Blood, especially so. With Dina, if you're running those, you're easily going to be going infinite. Nonetheless, you can also use this in the 99. I would personally use this in a Crush the Blood rated deck where you get to sacrifice another creature. Dina gets very big. You get to put plus one, plus one counters on Crash, And then if you sacrifice Dina, Dina is already big enough. And then you put it on Crash where he can swing for a game ending hit. Dina is very functional. She's also really good in battle cruiser decks, especially if you, even if you make Dina a Voltron commander, she can be extremely powerful as long as you're making you're making enough tokens or you have big enough creatures to activate her ability and get very big to swing out. Next we have Galazeth Prismari. Galazeth is a 3-4 for two blue and red for a legendary Elder Dragon fly with flying. When Galazeth Prismati enters the battlefield, you create a treasure token and artifacts you control have tap, add one mana of any color, spend this mana only to cast an instant or sorcery spell. Honestly, this is probably my least favorite. This and one of the other dragons coming up as well. This is a very artifact centered deck. And for me, as a as a conventional player, I don't like being limited to just one strategy, even though a lot of my decks are basically one strategy. But this is just limiting yourself to only using artifacts. And a lot of the time, players have mass board wipes for all kinds of permanents, in artifacts included. Now, that being said, the upside to this is if you run an equipment deck, your equipments can actually tap for that mana. And with blue and red, you have access to some of the biggest and some of the strongest instants and sorcery spells in the game. So that's not a big issue. Even if you're running like Togo in this deck, whenever you put a land on the field, you get a rock. That rock get now taps for a mana, effectively becomes a mana rock, if you will. Next, we have Hoffrey Ghostforge. Hoffrey is a 4-5 for three white and red, so three and Boros for a legendary dwarf cleric that has spirits you control, get plus one, plus one, and have trample and haste. And whenever another non-token creature you control dies, exile it. If you do, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a spirit in addition to its other types, and it has when this creature leaves the battlefield, return the exile card to your graveyard. Now, Wizards is not messing around anymore when it comes to Boros, nor is it messing around when it comes to Dwarves. In Kaldheim, we've so seen a very strong Boros commander, and now we're in Strixhaven, we're seeing another Dwarf commander that's really, really strong. Not only can you make this a pseudo aristocrats deck in Boros, where you basically gaining, you're getting a lot of life by sacrificing a lot of creatures, but Hoffrey allows them to come back in spirit form and give it a second round. Not only that, but it gives them haste. This is one of the commanders I'd personally pay attention to at tables, considering how fast it can go off. And next we have Killian. Ink Duelist. Killian is a 2-2 for a white and black, so just Orzov, for a legendary human warlock with lifelink, menace, and spells you cast that target a creature cost two less to cast. Initially, I didn't really get the hype behind Killian until I read closer to his card. Spells you cast that target a creature cost two less to cast. My initial thought was that target creature you control. With this new knowledge, this one is starting to grow on me a little bit more. 
The mana reduction to target creature, any creature, is very good, whether or not you're targeting your own creatures. Now, Lifelink and Menace is something we've already seen on Valentine, but a at a little bit of a bigger body, and the cost reduction on top of it is probably what captured most players' attention. Considering when you're playing stuff like Pacifism, when you're playing stuff like when you target stuff that targets creatures, it costs two less for you to do. Extremely good. And probably infinite combo enabling shenanigans. Next we have Quintorius, Field Historian. Quintorius is a 2-4 for 3 and Boros, so 3 white and red, for a legendary elephant cleric that has spirits you control, gets plus 1, plus 0, and whenever one or more cards leaves your graveyard, create a 3-2 red and white spirit creature token. Admittedly, Quintorius is not really an amazing commander, and I, I wouldn't even consider him threatening in any way, shape, or form. I'm debating whether or not he really can be in the 99 himself, because there's always better cards that do what he does better. There's always better anthem effects than he has. There's better recursion and token creation stuff in Boros, like Assemble the Legion, that are so much better than Quintorius. So I would, me personally, stray away from Quintorius as a commander, or even in the 99 himself. I'm sorry. Sorry, Quinn. Next, we have Rutha, Mercurial Artist. Rutha is a 1 4 for 1, and is it? So 1, blue, and red. For a legendary Orc Shaman that has two return Rutha Mercurial Artist to its owner's hand, copy target instant or sorcery spell you control, you may choose new targets for the copy. Rutha is one, another one of my favorite commanders in this set. The fact you almost never have to pay for commander tax on Rutha is amazing. Plus, she copies instants and sorcery spells. She's insane! She's most likely going to be one of the first brewing builds I'll make for this channel. Spoiler alert. Rutha herself, admittedly, she can't just do it on an instant or sorcery in general. It has to be one that you control, but considering you're in red and blue, which are the spell casting and the, some of the quickest decks when it comes to instants and sorceries, you should not have a problem getting Rutha back into your hand easily. Next, we have Shadrick's Silver Quill. So Shadrick's is a 2-5 for 3 in Orzhov. So three white and black for a legendary Elder Dragon with flying and double strike. At the beginning of combat on your turn, you may choose two. Each mode must target a different player. Target player creates a 2-1 white and black inkling creature token with flying. Target player draws a card and loses one life. And target player puts a plus one plus one counter on each creature they control. And this rounds off the top three commanders in Strixhaven that I personally adore. I will try to make these into actual physical decks one day to play on the channel, but for now, expect Brewing with 50 Bucks episodes on each one of these creatures. With that being said, Shadrix having Flying and Double Strike are amazing on their own, but really the kicker to this card is the, is the ability, where you can just constantly draw cards on your combat, and you can just give little shitlings to your opponents. Or you just give a plus one plus one counter on no creatures opponent controls if they don't even have creatures. You choose one of the two. Shadrix is probably going to be one of the better commanders that come out of this set. Me, per my personal opinion, saying this. Shadrix is just very good in general. If you're going to put him as a Voltron commander, he's small enough where you can play either Enchantress, Equipments, or just a general Voltron build on Shadrix, and you're constantly drawing that card and losing a life, admittedly. Next, we have Tanazir Quadrix. So Tanazir is a 4-4 four, four for 3 and Simic. So three, blue and green for a legendary Elder Dragon with Flying and Trample. Whenever Tanazir Quandrix enters the battlefield, double the number of plus one, plus one counters on target creature you control. And whenever Tanazir Quandrix attacks, you may have the base power and toughness of other creatures you control become equal to Tanazir Quandrix's power and toughness until end of turn. That's enough Tanazir Quandrix. Like I mentioned to you before, this is the other dragon I am not the biggest fan of. This is probably the weakest of the two dra of the two dragons. I personally see this in the 99 more than I do as a standalone commander. Like, to give you an example, I see this in either an experiment crash deck or in a Rolesque uh, deck where you put a plus one plus one counters matter so, so much. And we're getting down to the last three commanders with Velomachus, Lorehold. Velomachus is a 5-5 five, five for 5 and Boros, so 5 red and white for a legendary Elder Dragon with flying, vigilance, and haste. 
Whenever Velomachus attacks, look at the top seven cards of your library. You may cast an instant or sorcery spell with mana value less than or equal to Velomachus's power from among them without paying the mana cost. Put the rest of the bottom of your library in a random order. So this is arguably one of the strongest of the Elder Dragons. This guy has really good keywords, giving him flying, vigilance, and haste. First off, you're giving him evasion with flying. Haste, you're, getting, you're allowing him to attack immediately and getting the ability off. And vigilance, you don't even have to tap him. So it can block any small creatures that your opponents will have. Now the ability itself with this guy to cast an instant or sorcery practically for free is terrifying. This is another card I would keep a close eye on in a commander game. The penultimate commander card that we're gonna be looking at today is Zimone Quandrix Prodigy. Zimone is a one, two for Simic, so green and blue. Legendary human wizard with one and tap, you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield tapped. And four and tap, draw a card. If you control eight or more lands, draw two cards instead. Honestly, Zimone is kind of stale. Not to say she's bad, she's not the worst I've seen, but the ability has been done to death at this point. You've seen so many Simic commanders, Simic cards that have this ability. Tatiova, AC, just to name two. Honestly, it's kind of like the zombie movies from the early 2000s where you see, see a populous amount of them and even so in today's current cinematic viewing time loop kind of movies. We just saw AC two sets ago. We just saw a land drop commander in Simic in Commander Legends. Honestly, Zimone didn't really need to be in this set. This ability did not need to be in this set. It's just being stale at this point. The last card we're looking at is Cody, Vociferous Codex. Cody is a 1-4 for 3 generic for a legendary artifact construct. You can't cast permanent spells, but for 4 and tap it, you add Wooburg, so white, blue, black, red, and green. When you cast your next spell this turn, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile an instant or sorcery card with lesser mana value. Until end of turn, you may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Put each other card exiled this way on the bottom of your library in a random order. Cody is a unique commander, probably one of the most unique commanders to come out of Strixhaven and one of the most unique commanders to come out of Magic in general in just the last little bit. It gives itself to five color spell slingers and I can't get enough of it. The drawback to casting permanents is a bit steep, but you can always cast around him and cast Cody afterwards where you're benefiting off the cast and Cody is just giving you extra mana. So you're getting a five color commander with insane access to any number of big spells and just with the small drawback that you're not casting permanent spells. Well, that's gonna be it for today's video, guys. I know I haven't posted last week. Like I said, the move has been quite a big challenge for me the last couple of days, but I'm back at it. New video and the and we're gonna be continuing to put out videos for the next little while until something else big happens. <laughs> Hopefully not super super soon, but I digress. That being said, what do you guys think of today's video? Was there something that you agree or disagree with? And how do you like these commander overviews for sets? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you liked and or enjoyed this video in any way, shape, or form, give this video a like. Give this video, give our channel a subscribe. That's the only way you're gonna know about a new video that comes out. I post every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and there's always gonna be a premiere, so you're never gonna be in the dark about when there's gonna be a new General Warfare video coming out. And as always, we have our social media linked down below. There's only a couple days left for the contest to be entered to the contest, so go to Instagram. Like the, vi like the picture in Instagram, comment 333 for a chance to win a care package from, ti from Time Spiral Remastered. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you so much for your patience for the, the two week wait for the new video. I will see you guys next Friday with most likely a Brewing for 50 Bucks episode. Until then, cheers everybody.